You're listening to Natural Resources University. This episode features Working Wild U, hosted by Dr. Jared Beaver and Alex Few. Montana lawmakers and Governor Greg Gianforte say wolves threaten the agriculture and hunting industries and passed sweeping changes in Montana game laws during the last legislative session. The new rules, laid out in clear terms to the State Fish and Game Commission, makes killing park wolves much easier and much more likely. Many people, when they think about wolves, think of Yellowstone National Park. And for good reason. It has some of the best wolf watching in the world. On one of my first trips there, I saw four wolves eating on a bison carcass in Lamar Valley. It was pretty incredible. And a lot of folks felt like that experience might be in jeopardy as a result of the 2021 hunting season. That's because the Montana Fish and Game Commission eliminated the buffer zone with a lower quota that allowed for take of one wolf per management unit around the park's northern border. And so the change to harvesting 21 Yellowstone wolves just north of the park's border made headlines. Today, we're bringing you along as we explore wolves in and around Yellowstone National Park. We'll look at how wolves are managed differently depending on where they are on a map and what that really means for communities around the park. And what we're really talking about here is how can we envision a future where millions of non-consumptive users from across the planet have a say in how wolves are managed when they step outside of the park boundary. But first, we're going to go back in time to February 2022, at the tail end of the Montana wolf hunt, just as the number of wolves harvested reached the quota of 82 in Region 3. That's the zone that covers most of southwest Montana. And our producer, Zach Altman, will take us to the park border when we come back from a quick break. I'm Jared Beaver. And I'm Alex Few. And you're listening to The Working Wild You. A show where we explore what it means to share the working landscape with people and wildlife. Hey, Working Wild You listeners. We think you'll like another show from the Western Landowners Alliance, the Unland Podcast, a show that features thoughtful conversations with people who are living and working on the land and shaping the future of stewardship in the American West. The Unland Podcast is the audio companion of On Land, the magazine of the Western Landowners Alliance. Check it out at onland.westernlandowners.org and listen wherever you get your podcasts. So, where are we standing right now? We are right on the border of Yellowstone Park. Inside Yellowstone Park. So, this is the location of like the last known wolf that was taken in this area? That that I know of, yeah. And that was just last week. So, I am standing on the northern boundary of Yellowstone National Park with Ralph Johnson. He is an outfitter and guide based in a little historic mining community right outside of Gardner, which is a gateway community to the park. We operate a outfitting business right out of our place in Jardine, and we do summer horseback rides, summer pack trips into the Absarca Beartooth Wilderness, hunting trips for elk and mule deer, both in the wilderness and in the general season. It's still winter and, you know, the winds have blown a lot of the snow out of the valley, but it is still pretty darn cold out. Looking up, you can see the jagged peaks of the Absorca Mountains looming above us. Where we're standing today, this place right on the edge of Yellowstone, this place is a bit infamous right now. This rolling valley dotted with sagebrush and boulders right here by the glaciers 10,000 years ago, This is where hunters have been harvesting a lot of wolves this season. That was a big change from previous seasons, when hunt units bordering the park had a limited quota when it came to wolves. Most recently, it was one wolf per hunt unit. As we've discussed in earlier episodes, the total harvest of wolves didn't change much in the 2021-2022 season, but where in the state those wolves were taken certainly did change. Let's look at Region 3, which encompasses southwest Montana. Out of the 85 wolves harvested there, 60 of those were filled along the border of Yellowstone. So, Ralph, 
Why do you think there's so much wolf activity in this area? Because there's a, we, we got a couple different migrations of elk. We, we have elk migrating from there, behind electric they come over, like from, from Swan Lake Flats in the park, they come that way, and then we have a herd coming from Lake the Lamar and Blacktail comes through our, my part of the country up in Jardine. So there's, there's, there's usually a pack of wolves in probably pretty much every drainage. So We asked Abby Nelson about this too. Abby has been working with wolves for over 18 years in the greater Yellowstone, most recently as a wolf management specialist for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Typically, we see wolves set up their territories around elk-dense habitat. You know, in Paradise Valley, for example, elk are down low on private land all throughout the winter. So if you want to begin to understand wolves in the greater Yellowstone, follow their food. And around here, elk is what's on the menu. Most elk herds migrate to lower elevation private lands in the winter. That's because the forage is better there and there's usually less snow in the valleys. As we've discussed in episode two, that's where the best land is, that's where the people are, that's where the private land is. And that is confirmed by science. According to research by ecologist Arthur Middleton, elk herds spend up to 80% of their time on private lands outside the park. So it's no surprise that wolves follow the elk as they migrated to lower elevations outside the park, and then they were harvested as they crossed the northern border. That is, since the hunt quota has been removed. So again, we're talking about the 2021-22 season. And what we thought we had was a compromise. That's Doug Smith, lead for the Yellowstone Wolf Project. And so given that mismatch between our policies and missions, visitor enjoyment and protection of nature, and the states, we had a pretty good deal for 10 years. That's gone. That's hard to stomach. The compromise Doug is referring to was the formation of the limited wolf quotas bordering the park and the decision by the Montana Fish and Game Commission to remove this zone just before the 2021-22 wolf hunt season garnered international headlines and serious economic concerns for the gateway communities like the town of Gardner. And when we come back, we'll tackle another layer of this onion, the gateway communities who depend largely on tourists coming to view wildlife. Working Wild U is a proud part of Natural Resources University, a podcast network delivering science-based information for your natural resource management. Other current network series include Timber University, Fish University, Deer University, Fire University, and Habitat University. Available wherever you get your podcasts. So before the break, we closed on the economic importance of wolf watching around Yellowstone. Economists have found that wolf watching generates more than $80 million a year for local economies around Yellowstone. And with the impacts of the recent flooding events in the spring of 22, every dollar counts for these communities. And wildlife viewing is considered a non-consumptive use. And Jared, I know you have some thoughts around the subject of non-consumptive use. Frankly, I feel the non-consumptive user is a bit of a myth. That's not a popular opinion. But the idea of non-consumptive use of wildlife was to contrast it with hunting, where obviously the point is to kill and eat an animal. Other uses, like photography for instance, are non-consumptive in that sense. But it's become a sort of totem, like hunting has negative impacts but non-consumptive uses have none. And that's just not true. Aldo Leopold famously said something like, a conservationist is one who is humbly aware that with each stroke of the ax, he's writing his signature on the face of the land. And in this case, the metaphorical ax can be as little as too many footsteps in one place. Yellowstone, for instance, has well over 2 million visitors each year. Of course, none of them can hunt in the park. And to say all those people have no negative impact on the wildlife is just ludicrous. They take up space. They cause wildlife behaviors to change, usually not for the good. They impact what territory animals can use and when. And it's typically to sit in a line of 100 cars because bison are in the road. How is that non-consumptive? So just to play devil's advocate here, it's non-consumptive because nobody's shooting those bison while they cross the road. That's true. 
but human noise, our presence, our movements on the landscape still has an effect on the vegetation, these animals, and the ecosystem itself. And we have to be aware of that. That's right, Jared. And to quote our buddy Leopold again, all conservation of wilderness is self-defeating. For to cherish, we must see. And when enough have seen, there's no wilderness left to cherish. This sounds like another example of the tragedy of the commons. And a recent study from Colorado showed that there's a 40% reduction in elk habitat from recreational use. There's also interesting work happening in the Tetons, where backcountry skiing is contributing to a loss of critical winter habitat for bighorn sheep. Check out the show notes for more on both of those examples. Point is, we all have some effect, no matter what we're doing out on the landscape. But I guess what we're ultimately getting at is this. Non-consumptive users have an impact on the landscape and the wildlife that is often overlooked. Yes. And despite that, non-consumptive users contribute to the local economy, and that is a significant and important contribution. Wolf watching alone generates about $82 million for local economies around Yellowstone's easily watchable wolves. Yes, and let's zoom out a bit here. This shift to more non-consumptive use is really part of a broader shift in values in this country. We talked about this with Nathan Barley, a wildlife biologist who co-owns and operates Yellowstone Wolf Tracker based out of Gardner. We were one of the pioneers of wolf watching in Yellowstone, and now the industry has really grown. And that's great that the industry can have the capacity to, to serve so many people as well as uh, employ so many people. We've kind of come to the point where many people, many, many people are invested in wildlife, but they're not hunting and fishing. It's just the vast majority of people want to be involved with wildlife decisions, care deeply about these animals, but not from the standpoint of wanting to hunt or fish. Nathan has been highly engaged in wildlife management issues for years. As a member of the Gardner business community, he's also been an active voice in establishing a quota for wolves along the northern boundary. I think it was our industry that got to the commissioners that ultimately helped decide that there would be limited quotas around Yellowstone. We actually took them wolf watching, and they were stunned to see hundreds of people in Lamar Valley watching wolves. Like, this is a real thing. And while non-consumptive use, such as wildlife viewing, hiking, and other recreation generates serious income, there's currently no way to capture any of that money for wildlife conservation. Meanwhile, license sales and federal taxes on guns, ammunition, and fishing equipment are funding 60% of state wildlife conservation efforts. And this doesn't include the conservation practices being implemented by landowners across the West. So if non-consumptive users want to have a seat at the table on how wildlife is managed outside national parks, there needs to be a way to capture some of the value generated by wildlife watching and other recreation as well. I think we need to come up with an entirely new model that can still have some of the tenets of the North American model of wildlife management, but account for humans that are interested in wildlife in a non-consumptive way. And so one way that people have talked about is a backpack tax. Like a tax on outdoor gear that goes into conservation, similar to the Pittman-Robertson dollars that come from a sales tax on guns and ammunition. There's also talk of a wildlife conservation fee that could be added at the park entrance to help fund wildlife management and conservation outside the park, recognizing that wildlife don't know park boundaries. There was a recent paper that came out of Wyoming's law school where they identified that a $10 addition to the park entrance fee would result in $13 million of additional revenue for wildlife conservation. But some folks see this as a slippery slope. There's also the need to make nature more accessible to all. At some point, when you start adding fees and taxes to things, that can add up pretty quick and could impact who can actually access the outdoors in places like Yellowstone. When you look at how much people actually spend when they come to Yellowstone, an extra $10 doesn't seem to be much of a tipping point. And this hits on something that keeps coming up this season. 
What if the economic benefits of wildlife viewing could be shared with people who bear some of the cost of having these wildlife on the landscape or on their property? And Nathan Varley shared some of his ideas about this during our conversation. Can we have the great benefits, say, of an ecotourism model that's really working confer to a lot more of the community that's affected by those animals. And that's what we're not getting right now, right? Like there's there's compensation for lost livestock, but can they regularly share in the benefits of living with wolves through a mechanism where some of our tourist dollars can actually help them with habitat enhancements, proactive measures to prevent depredation. That mechanism, it seems like to me, a really easy one to get to if we just try. But all that we've covered today around the border of Yellowstone, it really represents a border between two very different views of the natural world and our place in it. Coming up, we're going wolf watching to explore the difference between preservation and conservation and why it matters. Hey listener, we really appreciate you listening to Working Wild U. And we have a small favor to ask. Please head over to our show notes and fill out the listener survey. We want to learn more about you and what impact this show is having. Your feedback will inform how we make the show in the future and help us obtain funding so we can continue this important work. Thank you. Now back to the show. Welcome back. Right now we're in the Lamar Valley in Yellowstone National Park. It's a typical summer morning. There's a small band of bison grazing in the rolling sagebrush at the base of some cliffs, and the day is beginning to heat up already. We're actually a little late to the wolf watching party. People who are serious about wolf watching are usually in position with spotting scopes and telephoto lenses before sunrise. And even though we're a little late, you can still feel the energy in the crowd. I'm excited to see what the day brings. The park has wolf technicians scattered all along the valley in many of the primary wolf watching spots to help control the crowds and and be available to answer questions from park visitors, which is a part of the park's mission for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of the people. We were fortunate enough to catch up with Taylor, a biological science technician for the Yellowstone Wolf Project, who you heard from earlier this season. Basically, I'm tracking out uh, the beta male of this pack. He fathers a majority of the pups. 1048 M. He is seven years old. And the beeping we're hearing is Taylor's telemetry unit. Remember those old TV antennas that used to be on everyone's homes? It looks like a handheld version of one of those. The significant beep that we can hear He's moving. This is a good signal. So this means line of sight. He should be in view for us. Oh, wow. Right towards this big rock here. Um, Okay, mm Mm-hmm. So should be traveling. Uh, His signal's kind of coming coming in and out, which basically means he's going behind hills and gullies and um, things like that. Wow. So, yeah, we should be able to pick him up. You got a better. Oops, sorry. You can go a little see multiple of them. Uh huh. Two are set of three. I only see one. Do you want to look? Sure. Yeah. Let me try this later. Oh. Oh. The wolf den is just out of sight. Wow. Can you see him? Mm-hmm. No. Nope. Well, see? It went he moved. To the top, Maybe. <laughs> in between those two big boulders. And they all just started popping. Yeah. And then it went right Did he move? He's gone now. <laughs> There's that little hill, and he was popping well, out over that little hill. Right in between those two big the, rocks. The, the round tree, there's a hole. That's, that's where they've been since two days. Oh, okay. So three, three or four cups and wolves. Gotcha. So, Jared... We both live pretty close to the park, and it's a huge area on the map, but it feels really different from the public and private lands that surround it, kind of like an island somehow. In some ways, it kind of is an island, right? Yellowstone, like all national parks, 
has this dual mandate for preservation and visitor enjoyment. That's a completely different mission from the other federal lands that surround it, let alone the state and private lands. I believe deeply in the Park Service mission because we're the only land-based agency in the country that has preservation as a mission. Outside the park, wildlife is managed toward a different goal. Federal land beyond the park has a conservation mission, and conservation was defined by the first head of the U.S. Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot, as the wise use of the earth and its resources for the lasting good of humankind. I mean, conservation and preservation are both worthy goals for kind of how people oversee management in the environment. One means no use, the other means wise use. And they're both great and appropriate. So let's tie this back to wolves. The border of the park is where two different management strategies and environmental ethics meet. Inside the line, you have people traveling from all over the world to watch wolves live their lives in the wild. You can watch them hunting bison. You can see them crossing the Lamar River with pups in their mouths. Even several wolf dens are clearly visible from the paved road. And people fall in love with it, even with specific individual wolves inside the park. And you don't see wolves, at least not this visible, outside the park. Because out there, their experiences with people can be really different. Back to Taylor in the park. You're not supposed to get attached to these animals, but you do, um, because they all have specific personalities and similar to watching your dog on the landscape. Um, Last summer, there was a cone standing in the road, and she looks at me, I look at her, I'm like, don't do it. She looks at me and she grabs the cone, and she's like, playing like a puppy. Uh, And it's like, you know, you want to be mad, but it's like, how the heck can you not smile, right? Um, So it's super hard not to get attached to them out here. Taylor is sharing a typical experience of visitors to Yellowstone. People all over the world fall in love with the wild version of their domesticated pups. And on the other side of the park boundary, species are managed at the population level using the North American model. And there are still people with spotting scopes. It's just that sometimes they're there to hunt wolves. And wolves don't know about the park boundary. This creates tension between these two management philosophies. When the compromise Doug Smith talked about earlier broke down last year in Montana, you could say it was a result of that tension. And as we're producing this episode, quotas changed again. The Montana Fish and Game Commission reinstated a wolf management unit and set the quota at six wolves for the area just north of the park's border. Six is much closer to Doug's compromise. And like with most compromises, It leaves most people slightly unhappy. Many people who come to Yellowstone to watch wolves would like wolf hunting banned entirely. Others say a border zone quota of any kind is unnecessary because wolves are managed through hunting statewide. This border zone story is much bigger than wolves though. This is a microcosm of cultural differences and the widening divide between the rural and urban public. On one side, you have the preservation model where humans and nature are considered separate from one another. But on the other, you have the North American model of wildlife conservation. We asked Doug about these dueling perspectives. The way our country works is you kind of have a checkerboard of management activity. So I think that kind of mixture, mosaic if you will, has worked really well for management of resources in this country. And it's hard because almost all the national parks Their boundaries aren't drawn perfectly along ecosystem lines. There's another important perspective on this idea of preservation versus conservation. One that applied before the invention of those concepts in the late 19th century America. Native people had been living in the Yellowstone region with wolves for millennia before it became a national park. Eagle Chief, a tribal elder of the northern Arapaho, talked about what this relationship means to his people at Yellowstone's 150th anniversary celebration in May 2022. The way that they used this area was their pharmacy and was a place of uh, kind of like what I might say the refrigerator. 
This is where they've captured and harvested a lot of their uh, game meat, although they roam many, many areas, many, many places, many times. But this particular area, there are people held in high esteem. This kind of sanctity, though, it can be tough to understand for people who grew up in the conservation-preservation duality. Yellowstone, in both of those frames of mind, is a wilderness. In theory, absent of human influence. But of course, people have belonged to Yellowstone forever, leaving their own signature on the landscape. So if any way that the, the Yellowstone Park could benefit our future also, not only the park's future, but for our future, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, that is what I would like to envision for the future of the park. At least 27 native tribes, including the Kiowa, Blackfeet, Cayuse, Coeur d'Alene, Shoshone, Nez Perce, and Arapaho, utilize the park's bountiful resources to support their way of life. Joyce Hunter, many bundle holder, who's the former tribal culture department director of the Blackfeet Nation, talked about how tribes continue to see use as part of a relationship of care with the land. And that conflicts with the preservationist mission of the national parks. We go up, they fish, they gather, we have ceremonies. Our Indian people were the attraction to get these parks built. But when they got established, then the Indians, oh, you're not allowed in there no more. You're not allowed to do this. We weren't just here to put on a dance and show for the tourists. We were here to do other things. Teach that history. Let us invite you into our lands to teach you how we use them. So with his saying, thank you for taking care of our lands, Yellowstone Park people and the United States government. You did a good job, but now you need to tell the whole story. Joyce Hunter is part of a growing call to allow tribal members to resume traditional land stewardship practices, including use, in national parks and other federal areas of their former territories. Finding a sort of third way, outside of the preservation-conservation conflict, together with Native peoples, might just be our best way forward. Agreed. And I think that's a good note to close on. In our next episode, we'll dive more into what it means when wolves disperse in the modern West, leaving parks and protected areas behind and interfacing with a human working lands matrix, the working wild. Working Wild U is a production of Montana State University Extension and Western Landowners Alliance with support from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, Western Sayre, and you, our listeners. Today's episode was directed and edited by Zach Altman and produced by Matthew Collins, Zach Altman, Alex Few, Jared Beaver, and Abby Nelson. Our hosts are Jared Beaver and Alex Few. Lewis Wirtz is our executive producer. Music is from Artlist and Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Nathan Varley, Eagle Chief, Joyce Hunter, Doug Smith, Taylor Bland, Abby Nelson, and Ralph Johnson. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>